All right. So the title of this panel is Art in the Commodity Form. If it is true that the commodity structure, Lukács, is the defining feature of modern capitalism down to the present, then it stands to reason that it has no less impacted the way art is produced, consumed, circulated, and exchanged. This shift in art's char character happened both objectively, e.g. as in an article produced for exchange on the market, and subjectively, i.e. as a kind of experience and form of expression for the social and individual body. However, art's relationship to its status as a commodity is an ambivalent one. Art has become at once more free from past forms of domination, but its freedom is constrained when subject to the dynamics of capital. Art as a commodity is both its cure and poison, and has become a social problem for its practice. Since becoming aware of this problem, artists, philosophers, curators, and critics have taken various approaches in seeking to overcome it. Uh, some questions that we've asked our panelists are, how has art under a capitalist society changed from its pre-capitalist practices? What is the commodity form, and what is art's relationship to its logic? Must art seek emancipation from the commodity form, or is it at home in it? In what sense does art take part in the left and emancipatory politics, if at all? So, um, as an agenda, uh, we'll start um, to my right, and each panelist will get uh, eight to ten minutes for their opening remarks, which they've prepared. Um, then, um, we'll take, the, each panelist will get three to four minutes uh, to respond to one another, also moving um, from left to right. And then I'm going to open it up for questions uh, from the floor for uh, about an hour. Um, if you could, uh, we'll just take one question at a time, if you could keep your questions um, succinct and uh, identify if you'd like one panelist or all the panelists or any combination of them to answer those questions. Uh, so on my, um, oh, one more announcement following this panel. We're going to be going to grab drinks at uh, Jack's Tap up the street. Um, if you're, you're all welcome to come and hopefully continue the conversation, and hopefully you, all, you three can all make it as well. All right, so Nick Brown, Professor Nick Brown, to so my right, teaches modernism, American, um, I'm sorry, modernism, African literature, and critical theory in the English department and in the Department of African American Studies, with an affiliate position in art history. His research interests include Marxism, Hegel studies, the history of, of aesthetics, Lucifer literature, I have to ask you what that means, and music studies. Uh, his current book, Autonomy, the Work of Art in the Age of its Real Subsumption Under Capital, asserts the resumption of the modernist sequence, not always in the expected places, in the era after postmodernism. Chapters of Autonomy have appeared in Nonsight, Postmodern Culture, and the Revista do Instituto dos Estudos, Estudos Brasileiros. Sorry about my Spanish. Uh, Portuguese, even worse. Um, <laughs> Next down the line, Nick Breeze uh, is a new media artist, educator, and organizer, living and working in Chicago. Uh, he's critically obsessed with the internet, and uh, all his work is related to digital culture, specifically digital literacy and ecology, medicine rights, glitch art, net art, and remix. He organizes events, uh, glitch, no media, and teaches at SAIC and Marwan, and on the web, and produces uh, work on these topics. His work has been shown internationally uh, in the File Arts Media Festival, the, Festival, the Images Festival, the Museum of Moving Image, the MCA, and uh, he's been featured in on and offline publications around the world. All right, so with that, um, yeah. hmm? oh gosh, Blake, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. I have one more, I wrote my biographies out of order, so I thought it was done. All right, Blake, my apologies. Awesome. Uh, has written, Professor St uh, Blake Simpson has written for Art Journal, Art Bulletin, Art Forum, October, Text zur Kunst, Oxford Art Journal, Third Text, New Left Review, Tate Papers, Etudes Photographiques, Philosophy and Photography, and NCOP, Journal of Contemporary African Arts, among others. And his work has been translated into French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, Polish, Serbian, Chinese, and Korean. He is the author of the Pivot of the World, Photography and Its Nation, and Citizen Warhol, and co-editor of five volumes that focus on various junctures of art and political subjectivity. He is currently working on a book to be titled Photography and God that takes up the lost political aesthetic of photographer Paul Strand. All right, now we have everybody. Do I get this? Yes. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Brendan, for the introductions. Uh, everyone hear me? I think so, yeah. Uh, thanks, Gregor and Drew, for the invitation, and thanks to you, Hardy Souls, uh, for coming out tonight. I'm going to apologize in advance for um, my addiction. I have a uh, dental um, malfunction 
that makes it hard to say certain, na certain words uh, quickly. And unfortunately, very unfortunately, one of those words is commodity, which comes up maybe like a thousand times uh, in the next uh, nine minutes. So anyway, I tried to answer some of the questions that were asked. Others, I hope you'll see, are sort of meant to be rendered um, not askable by, the, uh, by what I'm trying to say. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, given the official um, pretext or official uh, occasion of our uh, meeting today, I thought that the most sort of efficient way to go about things would to figure out or try to sort of state a version of what appears when we try to understand clearly what we mean by the commodity in the first place, and in so doing, maybe something will become clear about what we mean by uh, the work of art. So we'll see how that goes. So I want to begin with the question, what is a commodity? And the first thing that appears, as appeared also in the, in the gloss that Brendan gave a minute ago, a commodity is an entity whose purpose is to be exchanged. But in the simple formulation, we already find something peculiar. What is essential to the commodity is not its obvious or sensible purpose, but rather its exchangeability. Of course, an obvious objection arises to this, someone has to buy it, which means that someone has to be more concerned with its use than its exchangeability. But all this means is that the ontology of the commodity includes two standpoints. The consumer is concerned with use, the seller of, commodity, of commodities is still only concerned with exchange. The use to which the commodity is put is thus non-normative. As a seller of hemp rope, I will take, among, among many other factors, Factors that pertain to presupposed use, like strength and density, into account. But if Restoration Hardware wants to use hemp rope for picture frames, candelabras, doorstops, belts, curtain ties, placemats, and for all I know, silverware, that is of no concern to me. In a society like ours, whose very metabolism takes place by means of market exchange, the work of art is, of course, a commodity. For the moment, I'll take that to be uncontroversial. The issue, or the question, is whether there's something in the work of art that can plausibly exceed the commodity, and if so, to secure the conditions of possibility for such an excess. And to answer that question, we have to draw the consequences from the proposition that the work of art is a commodity like any other. If the work of art is a commodity like any other, then what is interesting about it, indeed, what is determinate about it, what we can say about it, is not its meaning, but the use of people or communities make of it. If the work of art is a commodity like any other, then what matters is not what it means, but what effect it will have on a beholder, or a reader, or a viewer, or a listener. If the work of art is a commodity like any other, what matters is not its form, but what escapes its form. These positions are all plausible, indeed widely held, indeed demonstrably true for very many objects that have a family resemblance to works of art. And they all have one thing in common, the denigration of the normative aboutness of the work of art, which is to say its meaning. And all this is not to say that these positions are even wrong, but to say rather that cultural studies, Barthesian subjectivism, and aesthetic, uh, sorry, and artistic literalism have at least one thing in common, namely that they agree that the work of art is ontologically indistinguishable from the commodity. But one thing we figured out you and I have in the space of the last two minutes about the commodity is that since it has no normative aboutness, no meaning, it makes no sense to interpret it. In other words, one cannot without contradiction insist that the work of art is a commodity like any other without also insisting that interpretation is a useless exercise. Conversely, if one takes up the work of interpretation, if one thinks, or if one insists without thinking by taking it up as a project that works of art are in some way about something, one is at the same time insisting that the work of art is not quite a commodity like any other, that something in it exceeds the commodity. For much of the history of art, at least since the end of the 18th century, in other words, since the beginning of the bourgeois era, the proposition, this proposition seems self-evident. Indeed, an elaborate system of, of institutions, all the way from informal guild-like networks to state institutions, emerged to protect the production of artworks from direct exposure to the dynamics of commodity exchange. The institution of art first comes under explicit attack, and you recognize the account here for the next uh, little bit is not mine, but Peter Berger's, the institution of art first came under explicit attack in the era of the historical avant-garde, uh, when the subsumption of art into life was undertaken in the name of a new kind of life, one radically different from everyday life as it was then lived. More or less the same logic undergirded the neo-avant-garde of the 1960s, when a social basis for any radical transformation was less evident. Today, the attack on the institution of art, while it borrows its radical gloss from these earlier moments, does not even bother pointing to a social basis that could undergird its radicalism. Without this, without a plausible alternative institution or set of institution or set of social relations to appeal to, the destruction of the institution of art can be undertaken in the service of nothing other than its subsumption into an existing set of social relations, namely the culture industry. The attack on the institution of art appears, so to speak, three times. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce, and the third time as bullshit. But it is the radical claim that is incoherent, not the subsumption of art into the culture industry, which is a real phenomenon. The proposition that the work of art is a commodity like any other is entirely plausible, even if its entailments are unattractive to, first of all, me, but let's say literature professors and fellow travelers. 
If one wants to insist on the normative aboutness of the work of art, to insist that interpretation is not only a coherent project, but a discipline, then one is obliged to produce the conditions of possibility for interpretation under circumstances that involve the real fact that for our works today, the risk of the commodity, the anti-normative judgment of the anonymous market, must be run. Not to do so results in irrelevance, or worse, reduction of the simulacrum of meaning as a market value. Indeed, the book I'm working on now is precisely to uncover or produce uh, the conditions of possibility for interpretation. It's a book, uh, and so I can't give the whole argument here. But one essential claim is that our own naivete, and I mean that uh, not in a normative sense, in a descriptive sense, our own vulgar, again, um, let's say, um, entirely uh, exoteric assumption that artworks are about something, is the enduring element of the institution of art. That sentence probably ended up not, not making sense. Our own naivete, our own vulgar assumption that artworks are about something, is the enduring element of the institution of art. But artworks themselves are allowed no such naivete. When the appearance of meaning itself has market value, meaning itself has market value, uh, the immediate claim of meaning turns into its opposite. Today, the work of art must account for the market, must produce a frame durable enough to withstand direct exposure to the market. The work of art must produce an account of itself, one that in includes account of its relationship to the market, and the demand that a work of art include an account of itself as itself, that the work of art, in other words, be as much an account of itself as itself, is the demand that the work of art has been making of itself since roughly the turn of the 19th century, a demand that has, since that time, been bound up with a dual claim of autonomy from, on the one hand, the market, in older Kantian language that the German uh, early romantics inherited, the agreeable, the judgment of the agreeable. And on the other hand, autonomy from the state in the same Kantian language, uh, the judgment of the good. Now, as to the relationship of all this to the, an emancipatory politics, I will say this, uh, you have to take it without the usual hauteur that the phrase I'm going to say usually implies. I'm not sure what that phrase means. The autonomy of the work of art is a specific autonomy. Autonomy with regard to the market, in other words, the plausible claim to meaning. My point of what I'm trying to say today is to produce those as sort of definitional, kind of a definition, a definitional identity there. It is at the same time unfreedom with regard to the institution of art and to the specific formal problems presented by an inherited artistic medium and the current state of the art represented by one's competitors who are not competing for anti-normative judgments uh, like purchases or clicks or have you, but rather for the normative judgments of one's institutional peers. Indeed, I would be hard pressed to think of any emancipation from one thing that would not at the same time be a binding obligation to some other thing. Freedom, creativity, emancipation, these things are not promised by the work of art or entailed in its claim to autonomy. What I can say is the insistence on market logic as the only operative social logic is both endemic today and immediately bound up with the ruthless upwards transfer of wealth. Inequality is both what the competitive market requires as its precondition and what it produces as its result, a result that is, on its own account, non-ideological. To insist on the autonomy of art is not so much to engage in an emancipatory, emancipatory politics as to insist on the possibility of politics in the first place. The autonomy of the institution of art entails not an emancipation, but a choosing of sides. Yes. All right, next reading. Mm -hmm. Sorry, give me a sec to pull up some images. If there's issues with sound, just you know, let me know from out there. Um, hey, my name is Nick Breeze, and I'm new media. Or I sort of describe myself as a new media artist slash educator slash organizer. So those, those roles kind of collapse in on themselves. Um, but generally, sort of my focus and concerns are digital culture and digital literacy, um, which are sort of pretty broad and ambiguous. Um, uh, but I could get into specifics um, as we start to converse. Um, in terms of digital culture, um, sort of the angle I come at this from, or my academic background, is new media art or internet art. Just out of curiosity to know how much, so I can gauge kind of the context here. Uh, internet art, are, are folks familiar with that as a, um, as a thing? Um, okay. Uh, and, and familiar with like the canon and the... Uh, you some of the names. Of the we, have, we have time. Okay, so, you, so yeah. I'll just real briefly say internet art, um, uh, like the name implies, is art made online, but 
that's also something really specific. It's sort of like a proper noun. It's got, um, I mean, artists have been messing around with the internet as, as a sort of cultural material, but also cultural context since the internet existed. But um, in those earlier days, it was more of a sort of folk practice by folks who were both programmers and, and creative individuals. Um, but that uh, the sort of medium or genre of internet art sort of came into its own in the 90s when the web became a thing and regular artists had access to the web uh, and thus had an opportunity to fuck around with it. And so a new genre was born. Um, and those artists came from all different disciplines for all different, um, or for a lot of similar reasons. Uh, and since the 90s, um, that's become a pretty official thing in terms of, you know, there's books and there's a canon and there's people in, in the inside and people on in the outside and established conferences and festivals and all the stuff that sort of goes along with an artistic movement. So when I say internet artists, I'm, I'm referring to that, that canon. That's sort of my, again, academic background, but my interests are also in and outside of those, that particular cultural sphere uh, and encompasses more just sort of like internet culture at, at large. Everything between like the f stuff in the MoMA and the stuff on Know Your Mean. And those, that's sort of where, where I'm at. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, all right, so uh, there's no internet, but I'll tell you what that video is. Um, so I was asked to uh, sort of like share some thoughts on how internet art sort of challenges um, this idea of, of art as a commodity. Um, and that, that challenge might, might mean a few different things here. Um, it might mean the kind of challenge that, that folks on the left get excited about, but it also to a lot of artists means a challenge to overcome. Uh, so, but, but the reasons for those challenges are one and the same, so I want to talk about that. This was a, a clip I wanted to start with from 2011. Um, it was a short interview with Lauren Cornell, who's the director of rhizome.org, which is uh, a website um, and archive and sort of general forum for internet art that's been around since the 90s. It's, a sort of, it's an institution. It's also associated with a physical institution called the New Museum in New York, um, and she was the director. And they had a booth at the Armory Show, which is a, a commercial art, um, art fair in New York. And they were doing something interesting and different. They were selling animated GIFs, um, which I'm sure folks are familiar with. So these were animated GIFs made by internet artists. And the interviewer was sort of like, oh, well, this is interesting. How do you sell an animated GIF? Because it's, you know, it's this thing on the internet. How do you put that on your wall? And then she explained that what they were doing was they were, the collector would purchase the GIF, and then they would remove it from the internet so that they could sort of have it locally and own it exclusively. And that tiny interview and that tiny snippet sort of set a little bit of a uproar in the internet art world. There's a couple quotes. That's Lauren Cornell's quote. This is another sort of internet artist, Tom Moody. There's a reason for using a democratic medium only to elitify it uh, for a select person. I'd like to hear it. So those were sort of the, that was the opposing sentiment. A lot of internet artists felt like this sort of um, was, was an internet art sin. It sort of compromised a lot of what made internet art exciting. Um, so a lot of those early internet artists sort of came to the internet as a medium for a handful of reasons. Um, there's a quote by an internet artist named Rafael Rosendahl, which I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he, in an interview with uh, Vice uh, magazine, he said that uh, while explaining why he, he prefers to make art on the web versus art on print, which is sort of where he came from, he says, you know, if you could talk to Leonardo da Vinci and explain to him that in the future there'd be a box where you could put your art in and nearly half the world would be able to see that art in their boxes instantly at any point, you know, at any part of the world, and that box not only had images, but had, could move and had sound and was interactive and then beyond that could be generative and beyond that could be networked and beyond that could be remixed. So there's, there's a whole new set of dynamics and possibility that comes with putting art on the web and all, ki all kinds of players that were normally a part of the art production distribution process that sort of get removed or sort of redefined in that, uh, in, in, in that context. Um, but when you take a GIF and take it off the internet and save it on a USB stick, it seems to sort of compromise all of those exciting things that brought the artist there to begin with. So that was sort of one opposing, one view in this sort of debate in 2011. The other side was was arguing in favor of Lauren Cornell, saying, you know, these institutions, these are nonprofit institutions that that exist to support internet artists and, and uh, mis misstep or not, um, it wasn't ill will. They're trying to figure out some way to sustain the practices of of artists that are producing material that that don't fit as comfortably within the commercial art market as a lot of a lot of other stuff um, because it isn't scarce it isn't this one object you put in a wall it's this thing that exists in sort of infinite copies um, and so I want to talk about some of what happened in the internet art world in 2011 as a result of that but I want to just touch on a couple ideas before that um, and maybe even just check in and see how many of these ideas are familiar this idea of a non rivalrous good sort of a folks familiar with this term all right so it's a it's a um, I'm not an economist, 
uh, but this is a, a, a term that comes from economics, um, and it's a perspective that I sort of positively sort of use instead of the idea of, of in place of the idea of scarcity in terms of thinking about the difference between uh, a work of internet art and a work and let's say sort of an old media work like a painting, and that the difference is that one is scarce and one isn't, and that's what what sort of changes its dynamic within a uh, within a market. Rather, I'm saying this is really more the case. So a non-rivalrous good. So a rivalrous good is defined by sort of two characteristics. One is that um, your use of a rivalrous good prevents other people from using that good. Um, and the other characteristic is that uh, in order to make, uh, that it has some sort of marginal cost. Marginal cost just means that in order to make an additional unit of that good, um, it requires some some resources and some amount of effort that could have, that cost something and would otherwise be used for something else. So the chairs you're sitting on, those are rivalrous goods because as soon as you sit on that chair, nobody else can sit on that chair. And likewise, if you want to make an additional chair, even though all the work of designing this particular chair has been done, it still costs something to produce an additional unit of that chair. So um, a non-rivalrous good is the opposite. Anybody, your use of a non-rivalrous good doesn't limit somebody else from using that good. And um, it has a marginal cost of zero or, or, or near zero. So a sort of a a flame would be an example of a non-rivalrous good. So if it's dark in here and then I light a match and that brings light into the room, we can all benefit from that. Uh, my use of the illumination doesn't prevent you from using the illumination. Um, and likewise, if I want to give you some extra fire, all I have to do is touch sort of my candle to your candle and it costs nothing. I mean, it costs some oxygen and things, like this, but virtually there's no marginal cost. Um, this is, a, this is a long Thomas Jefferson quote, which maybe I won't read, but I'll leave it up there and I'll explain the context. Thomas Jefferson was dis, dis sort of um, settling a dispute over patents uh, in his day. Uh, this is over elevator patents. Um, a patent, um, I think it's something, I mean, we're all probably familiar with patents. It's, it's a way of sort of pr protecting or rather giving you a monopoly of use over an idea. So you have some sort of idea. You don't have to implement that idea, um, but you just have to have it. You can sort of patent that idea which means the, the government grants you a monopoly over how that idea can be used. And we do that in the interest of providing incentive, because while ideas have a, a marginal cost of zero, um, producing them takes something. So a recipe is another set example of an unrivalrous good. If I share my recipe with you, anybody can use that recipe. Um, and it costs nothing for me to tell you that recipe. But it might have taken me some effort to produce that recipe initially. So we have patents. Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the folks involved in, in uh, pirating the British copyright and patent system over to our country when we were sort of setting up a similar system, um, sort of reluctantly accepted, accepted the patent and, and early copyright system. They all thought it was kind of embarrassing and not the best way to promote uh, cultural production, but um, it's, it's what they had, so they sort of reluctantly went with it. So when he received this letter about disputes over patent, his response was more kind of a reminder of like, let's, let's keep in mind why we have this uh, to begin with. And so this is sort of referencing this, uh, this idea of non rivalrous goods by saying that ultimately there's something really magical, something awesome about ideas, about information, that they can be shared freely and infinitely, that for the betterment of mankind, right, that there's something very um, um, rad about this. Um, and the only reason we limit it is, is because of this compromise of trying to provide some sort of incentive. Um, so rather than, than looking at internet artworks as being uh, not scarce, I'm sort of proposing we sort of discuss it this way as being non-rivalrous. Um, so in response to that challenge, so uh, I'll sort of take a sidestep from, from internet art and new media art um, and into sort of more popular culture um, because they had to deal with these issues before the art world had to deal with these issues. And probably one of the sort of cultural spheres that had to deal with the, the internet's challenge first was um, the music industry. Um, so, so music itself, a song from an information theory perspective is, is just that, it's, it's information and as such it's an idea and a non-rivalrous good. Um, but the way that we access that information, that song, is usually through some kind of copy, through some mechanical reproduction, uh, at least in you know, this last century. And actually in this last century, we, we, we created an entire industry around selling those copies and distributing those copies. And that was okay, generally, as long as that was the only way to sort of spread music. And as long as spreading music through copies was expensive and required some sort of um, special resources, then that industry made a kind of sense. Um, but once the internet sort of became a thing, that industry didn't make sense anymore, and they couldn't sort of rely on that sort of accident of copies being the only way to distribute that information, because obviously we could share music online uh, in, in a non-rivalrous way. So an MP3, um, again, is virtually non-rivalrous. You can copy and paste that song as much as you want 
without any additional cost. Uh, and you can share that. So the industry's response to that, to that challenge, um, uh, well, I mean, there was a, a few responses, um, but a lot of which was centered around this idea of DRM or digital rights management. Are, are folks familiar with this term? Um, it's a it's a digital, essentially a digital lock, which is a a, a way of um, controlling when and where a piece of media, a piece of digital media, is consumed. Should I explain this, or do, are folks have have folks have to deal with this on their day to day basis? And when you're trying to move your MP3 from your iPhone into something else, and you realize you can't because it's been locked down, in the interest of trying to force non rivalrous <coughs> characteristics, sorry, rivalrous characteristics on a non rivalrous good, and that has a lot of negative consequences, right? I mean, the obvious one of like if anyone's tried to move your MP3 collection or your PDF book collection to sort of from one theoretical bookshelf into another bookshelf and you can't because this bookshelf calls all the shots in terms as to where you're allowed to place your digital digital books. Um, also, DRM is pretty ridiculously easy to crack if you're somebody who knows what you're doing. And if you're somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, you could just Google your way to the answers written by the folks who do know what they're doing. There's also this idea of the analog hole. Um, so if you're playing music, when a music, a DRM sort of piece of music is on an MP3 or something, it's encrypted, but it has to get decrypted to play back. And once it's playing back, you can record that in a lot of different ways, and so that's a sort of loophole. Um, also, this distributes power in a really strange way. It puts a lot of power in the, in the hands of the, of the devices that play back the music rather than the content creators or the artists or the producers or even the, their representatives within various industries. So it's, a, it's, it's sort of a mess, but this was sort of one, one response that generally sort of considered um, not useful but still is implemented in a lot of different ways. Um, another sort of response from that sort of pop culture sphere, from the sort of, in this case, as an example, um, musicians, um, is all of this stuff. Is that too small? Can you read that? Uh, yes or no? Yeah, okay. Um, this is all obvious, uh, obvious things that pre-exist, predate the internet, but they mean something very different in the age of the internet. They've actually become much more accessible to um, sort of independent artists. Um, and these are also the only real ways, um, in this case, in this example, musicians have been able to sort of make a living without trying to force these rivalrous characteristics on, on their work. So just to say, this is, this is another perspective that the industry or folks involved in the industry took um, to sort of leverage the internet and find other ways to support their practices. Um, not ideal, but this is sort of uh, counter to, to the other one. So the art world, internet art, so they didn't have to deal with the internet until more recently. Um, but internet art um, <coughs> functions or wants to function in a lot of the same ways as the um, as as the most sort of bought and sold art in, in this country. So this is just a screenshot from a real popular um, art auction that happened um, a couple years ago at this point called Paddles On at Phillips, which is an art auction house that sells you know like old Picassos and things like this, and they were sort of selling these new media artworks. Um, just to sort of give, give that context. Um, and this is, this is also US specific, you know, um, internet art has a, has a slightly different sort of history and support system in Europe. Um, but in, in this country, a lot of artists sort of have to try to sell their work or, or, or at least they make that assumption before trying to look at alternatives that, that they have to try to sell their work in order to sustain their practices. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is, this is the end here. So, um, so the way that a couple of artists in the internet art world have responded is to also, in different ways, try to force uh, those sort of rivalrous characteristics on their work. This is an example of a show by Michael Manning outside of the New Museum, I think it was, or uh, IBM in New York, called Street Show, The Things Between Us, which, um, where he took a dead drop, which is this idea of sticking a USB stick in a building and putting content on it, and he curated a show, but he asked a lot of artists to give him the only copies of that work, so that this would be in some way special to sort of like reintroduce the aura into the conversation. Um, another approach was this website called Art Micro Patronage. It's hard to tell, but this is a sort of, it's an internet art piece, and on the bottom you could donate different, a different sort of amount of money, and you have a little logo up top, and you could go to the next pieces. And this was an online gallery that would put work up for a month, and if you donated, you could go back to that site and visit the work whenever you want, but if you didn't notice, donate, when the show was up, you'd be locked out. Um, and this is a response to that and to Lauren Cornell. This is a piece by a couple artists named Jeremiah Johnson and Don Miller where they um, sort of put up this website that was modeled off of early software piracy sites and decided that every time somebody would try to force those sort of rivalrous characteristics on that art, that they would pirate the work, that they'd create a torrent 
um, so that they were distributed in the same way that they distribute other sort of popular media, media, and they would do that on the day that the show would go up. So all the both the Lauren Cornell show and the two shows I showed are, are on this site, and they quote that Lauren Cornell um, video in, on their site. Um, and some folks were really upset about that, again, in the same way with Lauren Cornell, where they were saying, these are all people that are trying to figure out some way to sustain our practices. This isn't a perfect system, but how else do we do it? And their response is, if we can pirate it so easily, then that's not, um, that's not the way to go. And there's a few other examples. We could talk about how some other artists maybe have, have handled that, but just as a give you all base for the convo and the internet our world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> this will be pretty informal, it's just a few, uh, few notes uh, on the topic that I have. <clears throat> but uh, one way to think about it uh, in response to, um, to Nick Brown's uh, presentation, uh, perhaps, is to say that it's also concerned with something like what he referred to, if I heard it correctly, uh, as the, um, or maybe it was uh, included in the introduction, but anyway, the resumption of the modernist sequence after postmodernism. Something like that question. <clears throat> Uh, likewise, it might also um, be thought of as engaging with what Nick did say at the end of his presentation uh, about uh, insisting on the autonomy of art as itself uh, a way of sort of insisting on the political itself, if I had that correct. <clears throat> um, as far as the, the prompt goes, uh, in, a, in a sense, there's really one question of the, uh, you know, the, the prompt was very rich and, and, and uh, had lots of ideas at work in it. Uh, but of course a lot to address in, a, in an eight-minute presentation. Uh, so I sort of picked and choose between the ideas and the one uh, concept that um, this uh, presentation might be said to engage with is the, uh, the question of the commodity uh, being ambivalent, uh, a term that got used in the prompt, uh, prompt. And then they go on to say, art has become at once more free from past forms of domination, but its freedom is constrained when subject to the dynamics of capital. So I'm interested in thinking about um, I'm not sure that I would use the word ambivalence, but that tension between um, uh, the commodity form and arts autonomy uh, and thinking about uh, those things uh, together. Um, so on the one hand, um, let's see here. So I'm trying to be tricky with and have something on my screen and something over here, and it's not really working, so I may just do away with the PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> so on the one hand, um, the, you know, the conventional understanding of the commodity is that it is uh, mystical and mystifying and so on. Uh, the most famous example of this uh, from the commodity fetishism uh, section in the first volume of Capital, uh, you know, Marx makes the allusion to uh, a dancing table. Right? And he says that the, um, uh, the way in which social relations in the marketplace uh, end up substituting for real human social relations is like seeing a table dance. Right? It's a mystical, magical phenomenon. Um, and of course, this is um, absolutely true. There's no question about it. We, this is the way that ideology works. This is the way that we uh, become confused about our own sociality. We can be, become confused about our own desire. We become confused about our own humanity because we, um, we uh, imagine that that sociality is taking place uh, in the marketplace and not through our um, cooperation, our solidarity, and so on. So uh, one term we might put to that, one conventional term, is alienation. That, that is what alienation is. It's that confusion produced by the dancing table. 
On the other hand, however, we might also say <clears throat> that um, there's something about the commodity form that's not mysterious or grotesque, another term that Marx uses, or ideological at all. Uh, in fact, uh, it's quite a wondrous thing, a magical thing that produces real value. Uh, and of course, if we look at any um, uh, you know, graph of the history of wealth, um, one of the things uh, that you, we can't get away from, one of the things that's so patently obvious is that the commodity form has produced tremendous wealth. And that production of tremendous wealth, of course, is something that is uh, capable of uh, eliminating human need. Uh, it mostly doesn't do that, of course, for all sorts of reasons that we don't need to go into here. Uh, but that capacity is produced, and what produces it um, is the commodity form itself. Right? It is the engine of wealth. Uh, and so that is not mystical or magical or grotesque, but instead wondrous. Um, just to put a, a kind of recent, um, <clears throat> fairly recent um, a theoretical spin on this, we might uh, think about Frederick Jameson's um, invocation of uh, his, his discussion about Walmart as utopia. Anybody knows this? Um, uh, he says in one section of the passage in, in his book, The Balances of the Dialectic, he says, the sh uh, Walmart is the shape of a utopian future looming through the mist, which we must seize as an opportunity to exercise the utopian imagination more fully, rather than an occasion for moralizing judgments or regressive nostalgia. So don't critique Walmart, see it as utopia, right? And explicitly in his context, a Marxist utopia. Right? So if we imagine that as our figure of the wondrousness of the commodity form, right? Uh, invoking Jameson's um, uh, assessment of Walmart. So, um, what we might say then about the commodity form is that as a form, uh, it's primarily defined by a certain kind of enclosure. It's, it's an, it's a, it is its enclosure that produces the possibility of the exchangeability that, that uh, Nick started off talking about. <clears throat> and that enclosure uh, can be thought of in all sorts of different ways. It's certainly, we can thought about the enclosure movement in, in um, England in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, uh, think about that in the context of primitive accumulation, the idea of violently enclosing, you know, taking over areas of land as itself a way to uh, create the precondition for the commodity form. Um, <clears throat> we can also think about it uh, in a different register, and that is to say, um, in conjunction with the idea of the enclosure of the self, right? The production of a self that is um, uh, sort of radically constrained in its self-imagination, Right? And that produces the conditions of possibility for its exchangeability on the market. Um, of course, this self right, that emerges with modernity, with capitalism, um, is the sort of primary um, concern of, of art, at least since the Renaissance. Right? It is all bound up with the idea of that construction of the self. So um, the main ideological problem well, let me say, go back a little bit and say um, a couple things about um, the, uh, the first characterization of alienation. That one way to, to characterize that is uh, to use a, you know, a more recent uh, set of terms that comes from phenomenology, is that it is uh, a condition of life world becoming system, right? So our experience of our embodied lives on a day-to-day -day basis uh, becoming somehow systematized and in the process alienated from us. Um, but if we think about the commodity form as wondrous, as like Walmart as utopia, uh, we might reverse that uh, phrasing and say it's something like system becoming life world, right? That it's something like a process not of alienation, but it's opposite, a process of de-alienation, right? Of course, that de-alienation only appears to the consumer on the consumer side. It's still bound up with the alienation of the producer or the worker. Uh, but nonetheless, it itself you know, should be acknowledged as a, um, as a wondrous thing, a process of de-alienation, the you know, abetment of need, uh, et cetera. So uh, what I would conjecture here then is that uh, the main ideological problem we face um, <clears throat> is not so much that of alienation um, you know, or commodification. That is to say, not so much the idea of, of life world becoming system, right? uh, but instead the problem, the main ideological we, we uh, face is that system appears to us only as system and not as itself life world. 
right? That is to say, we don't, um, uh, you know, experience, because of the ideological function of the commodity form, we don't experience the systematicity of our economic relations, our social relations, right, as itself our life world. We experience it as something alien to us, right? Um, and so the challenge then, if that's the ideological problem, the challenge then is how to overcome that uh, misunderstanding, right, of system. That is to say, how to the challenge is how to experience system as life world, if you're following me. So uh, this is the, um, you know, this challenge, experiencing system as life world, really is in a way um, the best challenge posed to us by the Enlightenment tradition, by the modernist tradition, right? Um, and this is that which we might want to return to, um, as I referred to in relationship to Nick's um, project, um, to the project of enlightenment. Of course, it's, you know, it's a version of enlightenment. It's not, you know, what Adorno and Horkheimer call bourgeois enlightenment, right? One term that they use. But instead, enlightenment that's full of its uh, foundational philosophical promise, not enlightenment that has become science. Um, so there are many things we can say um, about this uh, idea that the, the um, that alienation itself, that is to say systematization itself, that is to say the commodity form itself is the basis of um, the possibility for enlightenment, the basis of the possibility for um, de-alienation, uh, et cetera. Uh, one is just a note in passing the conventional Marxian uh, understanding that the, the proletariat is the only class capable of enlightenment, that is to say the only class capable of class consciousness, of historical consciousness, the only class capable of being revolutionary, that the bourgeoisie can't have that consciousness. It's not accessible to them. And the reason it's not is because they don't experience the same alienation. They don't experience, the bourgeoisie doesn't experience itself as a commodity form in the same way that the proletariat does. So it's the proletariat's alienation itself, its systematicity itself, its commodity form status itself that is the basis of its capacity for enlightenment, for class consciousness, its capacity for revolution, its capacity for uh, changing the world. So um, this is just another way to say that um, modern sociality is itself a sociality of alienation, that it's caught up in a sense of enclosure, alienation, isolation, image, et cetera, that we experience sociality in its modern form Right, as not in a tribal sense and not in a, you know, a place-based sense, but instead in a mechanical cog in a machine-like sense. Um, this then um, allows us to get insight into Marx's early um, characterization of human emancipation. Right? Um, this is from 1843. Um, and I'm going to read you a, a sort of medium ish quote here. Um, Marx writes, uh, human, emanci human emancipation will only be complete when the real individual man has absorbed into himself the abstract citizen. When as an individual man in his everyday life, in his work, and in his relationships, he has become a species being. And when he has recognized and organized his own powers as social powers, that he no longer separates this social power from himself as political power. And so the gist of this passage that I want to take from this is that what he's talking about is the, you know, the critical moment in the whole Marxian project, which is when alienation flips over into enlightenment, right? Um, but it's premised on that alienation itself from the beginning. It's premised on experiencing oneself as a commodity form. It's premised on uh, experiencing oneself as the proletariat, that the possibility for that flip, right? That is to say, to experience oneself as uh, the abstract citizen as he calls it, or to experience oneself as species being, right? One has to experience oneself as a cog in the machine, right? One has to experience oneself as alienated in order for that to be possible. So, okay, yeah, I'll wind it up here. Um, so this leads to a, a couple of quick points about art then. Uh, the first point is just a general one, and that is uh, at, at their best, uh, artists, um, Modern artists uh, have always been uh, sensitives who have given expression to the experience of commodification. That is to say that what they, the value of the art itself is it speaks in symptomatic terms of the experience of being a commodity form. The main problematic or concern for art then is not resistance to or negation of the commodity form, 
right? But instead, a manner of owning it, a manner of uh, how to own it and transform that experience of commodification into the experience of enlightenment, into the experience of the abstract citizen, the emphasis on abstract there, into the experience of species being. Um, so if you uh, can imagine um, Seurat's painting from the museum downtown, right? The, um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, many of Seurat's paintings, uh, but we might use that as an example of a, a modernist enterprise with art. And of course, on the one hand, it's an incredibly alienated uh, image, right? All these figures isolated from each other, all, all separated apart by the little pointillist or division, divisionist dots, right? All wearing their new um, uh, department store clothing, right? Uh, it's an incredibly alienating image. But of course, we know from, from Seurat's politics, we know from the, the theory behind, the color theory and its relationship to social theory, we know that this was conceived of as being an emancipatory project you know, on some level, that it was a radical project, right, by definition, uh, and that it was exactly that alienation that was the condition of possibility for enlightenment, class consciousness, revolution, uh, et cetera. So we might say then that modern art as a whole, modernist art, you know, that at its best, that was always its project. It was to experience itself as the commodity form and then flip that, flip that over into enlightenment. Um, <clears throat> we might say that the worst kind of art um, in relationship to the commodity form is that which seeks to deconstruct it, right? That which simply seeks to show how commodification is functioning, how the commodity form, you know, is uh, sort of perverting our understanding of the world, right? because it doesn't do that hard work of owning the commodity form as the condition of possibility for enlightenment, class consciousness, et cetera. Uh, and so just to throw a couple of examples on the table, work that many of you will be familiar with, uh, um, just to have something uh, again on the table, uh, we might think of uh, various examples from the institutional critique tradition of art, um, um, Hans Hacke and Andrea Fraser, two of the best known artists in that tradition, both of them uh, great defenders of the museum, right? They're great critics of the museum, but it's the institutionality of the museum itself, right, that they're constantly returning to and holding on to, right, as compared to those artists who seek to simply uh, lay bare the, um, the ideological operations of the museum. And one final art example, and then I'll stop, uh, and that is our new colleague in the art department, Lori Jo Reynolds, um, whose practice she sometimes labels um, legislative art, right? Somebody who works with the legislative process uh, as her medium um, is um, another example that we might think of somebody owning the institutionality of art, owning the systematicity, right? Uh, not falling back on that, on the idea of life world as itself a kind of critical opposition to systematicity, but instead engaging with that and trying to push it to the other side. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. We'll pass the mic back to uh, Professor Brown. Four or five minute responses. Sure. Um, I mean, thanks for these totally um, provocative and interesting talks. I don't really have anything, any issue to take with them, only questions, uh, maybe additional questions to raise. Um, so you guys know that Bruce Willis is suing Apple to uh, make um, DRM protected music heritable. Right. He wants his children to inherit his, which is a good idea. I'd like my children to inherit my, uh, my uh, MP3 collection, but of course it's not. Um, so good luck with that, Bruce. Um, but so my, so my, my question um, for Nick, or just sort of something else to talk about, you know, obviously we hear a lot of um, nonsense or hype you know, about the sort of empowering um, um, possibilities in gate involved in internet art, and that wasn't what you were talking about at all. You're talking about something else, which is sort of the, the possibilities for the work of art entailed in like the, the possibility of not being able to enclose a, a work of art. And I, one of the things I would ask is why not just go all the way on this and just be stupidly utopian about it um, and just say, um, yeah. Like in other words, the, the, the answer to sort of all our problems is just sort of absolutely decommodify the work of art. You can't do it with things that hang on your wall, so well, you can copy them, I guess. Um, but you can totally do it with some art forms, and like, why not just go that, uh, make that into a program? So, for example, you hear there's always articles almost every week in the Times and elsewhere about uh, about music and DRM and, and how the music industry would fail uh, if that if that um, if uh, piracy were made easier or, or more legal or whatever. Um, I know a lot of musicians, but no famous musicians. Um, but of the musicians that I know, both the ones that have kind of sinecures because they have university positions, and those uh, who don't and are sort of totally struggling and usually young. 
Um, no one is in favor of like anything like a copyright protection uh, for music, precisely because no one makes any money from that anyway, except for uh, the music industry itself. So when you get the sort of spokespeople for that, uh, the spokespeople are always like Bono. I don't know. He might be good on this. I'm just making up names, but could, you know, there are always people who are like already millionaires from it. And the argument is always that the music industry has crashed, as though after 200,000 years of human history, probably 1999,999 years of uh, music history, um, suddenly people would just like stop learning to play guitar if um, if uh, if piracy were made uh, more possible. So you know, what about that? Just like the utopian possibility of just saying like yes, everything to just be free all the time, and that we would bring up sort of the number seven of your six bullet points. I mean, number seven would just be lose money. Right? In other words, not every, not every sort of endeavor, not every sort of cultural endeavor is actually going to make a profit or, um, uh, uh, or a living uh, for, its, for its owner or for its originator. So then, um, also, uh, Blake, totally interesting, interesting talk, and I was reminded of a book that I am just reading or just finished, uh, Ben Lerner's uh, 1004, which includes a little bit that he wrote for N plus one or, or, uh, or uh, LA Review Books or something like that. Jackman, I don't know, one of those on... Um, on uh, Total Dark, but in the, uh, in the, it's changed a little bit in the story. In the story, so he goes uh, and uh, his girlfriend or whatever she is uh, has um, contact with this insurance company that has all this Total Dark, which means that it's literally unsellable because it's on public record as having been damaged, which means they just store it, um, but you couldn't sell it anywhere because no one would buy it because it's on record as having been totaled. And so it's valueless. So immediately in the book version, that kind of bifurcates, right? His version is like the one version which you can read in whatever journal it is. In the, uh, in, the, in the novel version, um, it bifurcates because the, the girlfriend sees like the, the um, you, now you get to just like take a bat to Jeff Koons and that's awesome, which is also true, or would be also true. Um, but then his version is then you suddenly see the, the, um, the decommodified de artwork. Um, but I would want to point out sort of another sign to that which he doesn't bring out in the story or the version, and I think this gets to Blake's point, <clears throat> is that you're also not seeing it in a museum. Right. In other words, you can see decommodified art in a certain sense. It's not exactly free, but it's theoretically free if you don't, uh, if you don't pay the money, the, the donation or whatever. Um, but it's important it's not a museum. So sort of the other version of, sort of the opposite of the Ben Lerner account is uh, the first time I saw, uh, it was in Chicago actually, the first time I saw a um, recognizably to me, my young self, museum quality piece of art for sale. It was not at a price that I could afford. I was like, wait a minute, I know who that is. And that's actually something that if I had like that much money, I could buy. And that's also tremendously exciting, right? Uh, not necessarily the possession, because that was never a real possibility for me, but the fact that you're actually seeing it in a way where your relationship to it would not be sort of edifying and pedagogical, where your relationship would be, yeah, it would be owning. The point of it in that moment is not that you're owning it, the point is that you're not encountering it in a pedagogical context, to end sort of, just as for a learner, the point of encountering it in the total context is you're not encountering it as a commodity. And again, just to in, use my one minute for like exactly one minute of thought, I mean, that is, the, um, that is the point of the Kantian idea of the aesthetic judgment, to separate it on one hand from judgments of the good, judgments of the edifying, useful, and so on and so forth, and on the other hand uh, from uh, judgments of the, of the agreeable, and sort of both of those things, in other words, the emancipation from the good is sort of the function of the market, but then of course the work of art also had to separate itself out from that, you know, again, obviously in a certain sense liberating um, uh, autonomy from the state and from the edifying or control and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was just, I guess, respond to. Can you go ahead? Yeah, sorry. Um, respond to that. Is that other thing hanging around? Respond to the, the first point a little bit. Um, I guess maybe in a couple different ways, like in a personal way and then a sort of like devil's advocate for the sake of conversation sort of way. Um, personally, um, I guess I'm much more interested in culture than I am in art. Um, and. It's an important distinction if we start to talk about it. Um, and the, yeah, the idea of like embracing this, whatever, is kind of utopian idea about, um, yeah, why not embrace, em embrace that characteristic and, and then slowly money and, and its relationships are pulled out of the equation. Um, I'm even, even maybe beyond that or, or a twist to that, I'm sort of interested in like, um, in, like when I look at the internet, very interested in like memes and memes in the, colloquial sense, but also in the Richard Dawkins sense, who's a sort of evolution, evolutionary biologist that coined this term to sort of try to explain the behavior of genes um, in the late 60s. Um, and the idea was that, you know, and I don't know if folks are familiar with Richard Dawkins, is a sort of famous biologist, um, and did a lot of, you know, filled in a lot of 
Blank's post-Darwin in terms of evolutionary biology. And one of his big twists was that um, we don't have genes. Genes use us. We're kind of like megabots for genes. Um, and everything that we do is sort of in service to preserving them across um, organisms and generations. And so he uses the meme as a sort of metaphor to sort of help folks understand that perspective. And it's a sort of cultural information maybe version of that where he says memes are good ideas or culture and, and, and art and, and, it's, and it's sort of related things. Um, use us more than we make them and a good idea a good idea finds its way across a lot of hosts, um, be they artists or you know other folks in those relationships. Um, and I think the internet does a really good job of like pointing that pointing that out, you know, or almost like validating that Dawkins perspective. Um, and I, for a list of reasons, did that and and would sort of say, yeah, beyond the embracing that potentially for me, I'd say like even flipping the, the the notion that we that we make this stuff more that we host it. Temporarily, um, on the flip side of that, I guess part part of the counter argument, like I mean, I ask a lot of musicians and stuff, and I feel like that that conversation is still kind of split. There's a half that gets that this is a, that that sort of is a futile battle with DRM and everything else, and there's a half that feels like if I'm not compensated, then I won't work, and if I don't work, where's the music? Um, and the idea is like, well, music existed far before, um, and it's not going to die just because with the death of this particular industry. Um, but is, the devil's advocate side to that is um, there's this idea, there's a, there's a writer named Andrew Keane who was called the Cult of the Amateur and there's an argument there that's sort of shared amongst some other folks where that it's, it's the issue is more that it's the death of this meritocracy, that the industry was very good and capitalism is very good at filtering, I guess for lack of a better word, there's a lot of music but not, not much of it is very good um, and, and with that sort of system in place we can ensure that the good stuff gets to more people. Um, and without that sort of system, <coughs> that meritocracy is compromised, and we get we get cacophony. And this is again just the sort of devil's advocate sort of pitch. Yeah, great. Um, I guess for Nick Brown, um, um, I would um, you know one question I have. And, and I'll, oh, yeah, I'll just raise this as a question. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, I'm thinking about the concept of autonomy as you're using it. Um, and, um, and the question is, to what degree, um, is, how, how does the distinction between freedom from and freedom to play out in, in the concept of autonomy uh, as you're using it? And by extension, um, <clears throat> um, how does the, uh, it, it seems that if we you know, hold on to that idea of freedom from and freedom to, and you know, a, a, a very specific political extension of that is to think of um, uh, you know, theories of the political that have uh, defined it around the, the figure of the, the enemy, right? And so, um, you know, and if we think of our political relations as ones uh, that are contentious uh, and about um, <clears throat> a relationship to an enemy, then the, the category of freedom from is going to be very uh, important to that category. Um, but I'm wondering to what extent is the, and, and of course we can't do away with that, that's, uh, you know, that's a central central to the idea of class conflict, among other things. So, um, uh, but the question is to what degree uh, is there, um, uh, you know, a freedom to notion, something that might be associated with Marx's idea of the abstract citizen, uh, associated with the idea of the party, associated with the idea of solidarity, um, associated with the idea of class consciousness, uh, et cetera. How does that play out vis-a-vis -vis the concept of autonomy uh, in uh, what you're doing? Uh, for Nick Briz, I, um, I would, um, you know, I appreciated the the non rivalrous goods discussions and so on. It made me think of the uh, you know, the, the little uh, internet ditty, "Copying is not theft," <clears throat> as a as a you know a one version of that. Um, I guess the the question, um, and maybe this is an extension of what Nick Brown was uh, raising, is um, you know uh, what about. Um, you know, there have been arguments made about uh, the um, uh, production, about the valorization of, of um, free music and free books and things like that, uh, contributing in a strong way to the massive redistribution of wealth that we've seen over the last 30 years, uh, 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, to what degree um, does um, pushing on that um, piracy issue what degree is that disenfranchising, at least within a local uh, context? Um, so one of the things I talk about with students periodically um, is the way in which uh, you know we are all uh, workers in a big factory. The big factory is the internet. We all um, um, 
uh, do things like you know, comment on Amazon.com about products, and we provide these free services that add value to these products. Uh, and in, in, in the course of doing that, we're exploited, right? Um, that our labor has been exploited, right? Uh, and of course, this is uh, the conditions of possibility for class consciousness and so on, um, but it also is a condition of possibility for, at least in the short term, for making demands about, um, about uh, remuneration. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's the question. To what degree um, are, we, are we shooting ourselves in the foot by um, pressing on the piracy side of things? Mm -hmm. And then I'll, let me add just one other thing and then I'll stop, and, and that is I quite like the, you know, some of the things that the Pirate Party has been doing, uh, and particularly um, their production of <clears throat> uh, uh, these, this software platform for what they call liquid democracy. Um, which is a way of um, uh, essentially um, giving your vote to somebody else, um, allocating your, your vote on any particular issue to somebody else in a very fluid way. And so um, the question might be then instead of, of you know, uh, piracy as the, the solution, um, might there be other solutions that are systemic that have um, more democratic potential in them and do not run into the problem of um, self disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. You know, I have some thoughts, but. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd like to actually just do a very short round um, just to kind of let you guys respond. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, just really keeping it brief. Two minutes, then we can bring the audience in immediately following that. Um, so let's start again here. Nick. Yeah, so super quickly, I would say that just like, um, as far as the difference between autonomy and freedom, or autonomy and, and emancipation, or any of these other things, I mean, I have a very thin conception of freedom, uh, partly because uh, I don't know if I've ever uh, experienced it. But as, um, as a professor, obviously, I have a certain amount of autonomy, right? But that's like a totally different thing. In other words, you're not free first, and then like you're horribly subjected to the discipline of the institution. <laughs> Rather, it's like as you sort of get, um, sort of grip, get sort of a grip on an institution, in other words, start to begin to understand how, it le how its levers work, uh, how its discourses work, and so on and so forth, precisely by subjecting itself to it, you gain a measure of autonomy. But it's like the less free you are, the more autonomous you are in a certain sense. There's a, a parable, quickly, I don't know how many of you know Kafka's um, uh, report from an academy about the ape who becomes human. He's captured in Africa, presumably, I think it's supposed to be Africa. Uh, and um, you know he doesn't like it on the ship, and then he thinks, well, okay, so what's my, what am I going to do? Uh, maybe I'll escape, right? But of course, for on the ship, what does escape mean? Escape means either getting put back in your cage, or it means death, because you're just going to run, uh, you're going to jump off the ship and escape uh, to your drowning, to uh, a watery death, um, a watery grave. Um, but then the other alternative is to become human. Right? Obviously, for the ape, this is, or for a non-human ape, this is a tremendous um, uh, feat of both mastering an alien discourse and subjecting yourself to an entirely alien form of, form of life over the course of the story. He tells you how he did it, and then he attains, not by the end, not freedom, right, which he doesn't have and neither does anyone else, but a way out, like a specific thing that he was not wanting to do and then produced by his subjection to like another institution, um, a way of not doing that thing. So that would be like one way of doing uh, autonomy rather than freedom. Again, freedom, you know, um, usually just means freedom to choose, which in our society just means like what toothpaste uh, you want to you want to use. So um, then the quickly thing, uh, the other quick thing I would say about um, well uh, about uh, commenting on Amazon versus versus um, book publishing. So you know Sebastian Budgen, editor of uh, Verso Books, is a big uh, sort of he meant himself to be sort of a hard hitting realist about book publishing. He says, look, okay, we you know I know that we're all communists, but you know. Someone's got to make those books, someone's got to sell those books, and if they sell those books, uh, then someone's got to make money on those books to make the next book. Uh, that sounds very hard-headed hard and realistic, but of course, 99% of the value produced there is produced uh, offstage, not by the book industry, not by Verso, not by Sebastian and his minions, it's produced by us when we're sort of making, having conversations like this, the ideas for things I didn't say well go into the next draft of my book, and so on and so forth. We make the value here, uh, Sebastian, Rudgeon, and Verso. Again, yeah, you know what, they're not for profit, great. I mean, I'm glad they have it. Uh, I'm glad Verso is there, but it's not as though that's the only way to do it. It's not as though if you produce ebooks at a small loss every time, uh, you're like destroying intellectual life forever. In fact, quite the opposite. And the other thing I would quickly say about that, again, back to the next point, is that you know the other thing we have still, although it's obviously under threat, but you know this place where we can make demands where things might be going the other way, it's hard to say. We still have a public education system, and so the place where a lot of this value is made, not just for uh, what we're doing right now, but for music as well. I mean, ninety percent. I mean, you know, the percent is meaningless. Like, in some sense, sort of massive production of the value 
uh, of the use value of what you hear when you hear a piece of music is produced uh, in um, the knowledge embodied in like the actual fact of like a fretboard on a cello. Uh, in um, in uh, you know, music history as you could learn in public school um, and so on and so on and so forth. Music appreciation is in, in, in public school and so on. So that this value is already um, is already free in a certain sense. It's just like this last moment, then it's uh, uh, what's the word enclosed. Thanks, Nick. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So just a brief comment. Oh, yeah, a brief comment. Um, if it was very obvious that I love piracy, um, I should maybe just say as a side note that from, piracy is a kind of ism, which is a step in a in a in a sort of next sort of ideal scenario. You can't pirate a meme, right, because it doesn't exist when you get to sort of that, that conception of culture. So the idea of, of the Amazon, yeah, like that's that's most definitely, the, it's definitely not like let's share this, on, like like screw the screw the publisher and then in, in the end we unknowingly sort of end up um, getting disenfranchised by, by another system, which is very, very real. Beyond just like putting, making a comment, just Google mapping your way somewhere you're sort of an employee to an AI system that will soon replace the taxi drivers. Um, so, and, and every, every, nearly every use of, of any free service online is, um, is doing this. And in the art context, uploading a video to YouTube might seem like an empowering act because you said, fuck you to the industry, but ultimately you, you possibly sort of removed more agents. You, you, you could have, th maybe theoretically we can debate this, um, lost a little more agency than you had in a pre-existing sort of in a different sort of system, but that's definitely what what I wouldn't be in, in favor of. And when folks say, you know, information wants to be free, that's if there's something to it, it's that's not the right direction to go in for sure. Yeah, no, just to tack on that briefly. I mean, you know, free isn't freedom rather than free isn't beer. You know, is the right. great <clears throat> enduring uh, slogan of, of that distinction. And, and I agree completely. And then the question becomes about the logistics, right? right. If you establish that as the, the Foundation, um, how do you how mm -hmm. do you implement that logistically? Yeah, um, which we talk about too. What's that? Which we could talk about too. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, oh. Okay, and then one one comment for Nick and, and Nick Brown, and that is, um, <clears throat> um, you know, I think the way that I was uh, using the word freedom is is um, I'm meaning uh, freedom is self-determination. And, and so I mean freedom, you know, freedom is in freedom of, of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, it's uh, the distinction between um, freedom and liberty, for example, as it's used in political discourse in this country, you know, is a latter-day kind of false distinction uh, that, uh, you know, is, is itself, um, you know, ideological. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, you know, th again, think about uh, freedom too or, uh, or autonomy. Uh, the autonomy that comes from uh, being a citizen. So one example of it is if we think about the faculty union or the graduate student union on campus here, you know, is that a condition of autonomy? You know, is that, you know, does that produce autonomy? Is that the autonomy that we're speaking of? And, uh, and of course, that's a very different <clears throat> uh, kind of autonomy uh, um, than um, one that is defined, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the enemy. It's bound up with that definition as well, right? But the solidarity part is itself, you know, a, um, a condition of, of production of autonomy. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you, guys. Um, I'd like to open it up uh, here now to the floor. We have about half an hour or so um, for questions. Please ask. Uh, we'll just take one question and uh, try to keep your question brief so we can get as many in as, uh, as possible. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Greg. Hi, thanks for uh, presentations. My name is Lou. I'm from a um, member of Platypus. My question is for uh, Blake Stinson uh, with regard to, I guess, a theme kind of throughout your, your presentation, uh, starting chronologically with um, Marx, uh, his section on uh, commodity fetishism. Uh, this is just a point of clarification, but um, it seemed as though you were saying that Marx thinks that the commodity is magical, when he's saying that the commodity is, like, the necessary form of appearance of the commodity is that it's magical, that it has this ghostly character to it. Um, I agree with you. Right. Okay. I just needed to know. For sure. um, building upon that, then, um, when you talk about, to use uh, your example of Frederick Jameson looking at Walmart uh, and seeing the ambivalent character of Walmart as being both, as having the potential for utopia, and um, but it, se it seems to me like as though you're saying we already live in, in socialism. All we need to do is have the right thought about it. Now, tell me if you're. 
tell me if I'm pigeonholing you with this, but it seems as though you're characterizing the, the problem as merely a thought error on the part of the alienated subjects of the world. Yeah, no, that, I mean, just with that one example, it would be the workers taking over Walmart. Right? Okay. So. Um, No, I mean, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, I absolutely would not want to make either of those uh, sort of, you know, mistakes that you suggested um, that, um, so, um, you know, the question of Walmart is that it's, you know, it's got, um, you know, it's got logistics down that create the conditions of possibility for the alleviation of need, and that's what Jameson, you know, uh, sees as its utopian potential. Uh, and of course, you know, his, his inv invocation of Walmart as a utopia was a provocation, and it was meant as a provocation, but, it, but at the same time, it's also serious. Um, and it's, it's saying that, that, and it's making a basic Marxist dialectical point, right, that socialism is only possible um, building upon capitalism, right? Socialism is only emerges out of capitalism. It doesn't, it doesn't reject capitalism. It incorporates that, and what it incorporates uh, first and foremost is the, um, you know, the sort of economic function of the commodity form, but, but equally so the, um, the alienation that the commodity form produces because it produces a new kind of sociality, no longer the old tribal model of sociality, but instead a cog in the machine alienated sociality that is the condition of possibility for class consciousness. So my second point has to do with, uh, sorry, my second point has to do with, uh, with what you were just saying, that alienation, or, or the, the quote from Marx about uh, man uh, will become free when he um, attains to the concept of his species being, um, or attains to the concept of the abstract citizen. Uh, and then we're kind of in the realm of talking about democracy and stuff like that. To push it a bit further, I, uh, or to twist, to twist what you're saying, I, I would say that in a way we have already achieved this abstract citizenship, but it's kind of like in a, in a deranged sense, in that we're all kind of free subjects under capitalism, and yet we're also unfree. I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and I would agree with that. That that is the you know that is the alienation of the commodity form, and and absolutely it is deranged. But it is at the same time the condition of possibility for class consciousness, which means the condition of possibility for revolution, social change, uh, and so on. And so remembering that value that the commodity form brings us, right, and um, and not sort of reveling in it in some kind of uh, you know cynical. Um, I know what this is all about, I'm just going to play the game way, but instead seeing it as the condition of possibility for class consciousness um, is what I wanted to highlight. And then the argument was that this is what modern art always did at its best, um, postmodern art maybe less. Question? Um, 
Well, I think that the um, that the in a way that this is a, is exactly the problem or the question because this is what you know the art of our time and and uh, by that I mean really art since World War II, um, you know, um, which I think of as really being dominated by a very consistent project, very consistent aesthetic sensibility. Um, and that sensibility, you know, essentially is one that's bound up with giving up on modernism, giving up on the Enlightenment, uh, giving up on um, the idea of building a better system, you know. Um, and uh, as such, it defines itself in Foucauldian micro-political ways or, you know, all sorts of other ways that we all know uh, well about um, as um, <clears throat> stepping away from that question of systematicity um, as the condition of possibility for autonomy, uh, as the condition of possibility for freedom, uh, and so on. And so in, in a way that your question, what do we, what, how do we um, ask, you know, what do we say to a critic or an artist, you know, who's bound up with that project? It's, a, I think, a super daunting one because it's so, it's so much the air that we breathe. It's so much the, um, uh, you know, the, the condition of the world, the discursive condition of the world that we inhabit. Um, and so it's only, you know, people like Nick, um, <clears throat> Nick and Nick, uh, you know, both uh, in different ways, I think, you know, who, uh, you know, are raising, uh, like, the idea of sort of returning to the modernist idea in some form or another. Um, but that itself just seems so, it's just it's so barely visible uh, because of the world that we live in. Um, and so the, I suppose what you say then is to provoke. Um, you know, and so I think of Jameson's Walmart as Utopia as a kind of example of a provocation. You know? um, so you know, imagine conversation between Foucault and Jameson, and Jameson says Walmart is Utopia, what's Foucault going to say? Right? It's, it's a completely different register. and. Uh, and, uh, and that would be the challenge. Uh, I would say a couple things and try to do it uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so the first thing is to say, you know, when you encounter a work of art or, a, um, or an art historian making the claim, which is obviously, so, I mean, I think the clichedness of it is actually an indication of the fact that it's sort of um, no longer current in a sense, even though it's like all too current. Um, that the idea of celebrating the sort of non-ontological specialness of the work of art uh, is a totally legitimate and fair and normal thing to do because most of what we encounter in this, like that, for example, sorry, whoever is someone who did that, like, is in the room. Um, but like, the encounter of things that are not with things that are not art is like totally common and totally okay, and like, we don't, not everything needs to be art. But if you're going to do that, and uh, at the same time make the claim that certain kinds of objects are in fact art, despite not having any sort of ontological basis for saying that, those people are like engaging in a contradiction, and like that's just like that's just like a contradictory position that should be like criticized brutally at every turn. And the other thing about um, about you know where alternatives are to be found, I would just say that you know ambitious art uh, is partly because um, of the fact that. Uh, that the, um, it's now the sort of claim of heteronomy that sort of has the strong class element, right? Because that's the only dis distinction left between art and non-art. If you sort of really give up on the idea of the ontology of the work of art, the only thing left is both between expensive art and cheap art. Because of that, or as a sort of side effect of that, a lot of ambitious art, I mean, a lot of ambitious art is in museums, a lot of ambitious art is like from prestige presses, but a lot of ambitious art isn't. And like part of like my project is to figure out is to find things sort of aggressively and sort of successfully frame themselves as not being commodities or as being more than commodities and, and sort of do resume the modernist sequence in a certain sense, but don't do it necessarily in the media that modernism uh, took as its, um, uh, as its main, like five media or whatever. And I think yeah, we can talk about examples when we have more time, but there's lots. There are lots. Yeah, so I mean, is it is it about looking at different work then? I mean, is this yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it would be rather than than asking new questions about the works being discussed. Is that <laughs> or maybe removing certain things from the equation, like the artist? Um, what, I mean, how does how do the questions about its success in in playing the game sort of become strange when you know, some of those variables are in the equation? I don't know. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Blake. Um, so I guess my question is, 
could be more specific for the increase. Um, I, I guess by way of like a short anecdote, so like, I don't know if you are familiar with the um, Free Software Foundation, but um, mm -hmm. kind of another group that based itself off the freeze and freedom, not freeze and beer mm -hmm. um, slogan, whatever. Um, but for me, that's a good example of how like Richard Stallman, for example, uh, poured an immense amount of his own effort into the GNU project, um, which evolved into Linux and is now extremely important, um, but it's been uh, appropriated or co-opted by um, you know, the capitalist at large, um, which is not to say that that wasn't a good thing to do. I mean, it still has uh, implications for, for freedom um, globally. And, you know. So I guess uh, my question is, um, well, to finish that point, like at the same time, nobody is a member of the Free Software Foundation. It's like a really small niche club, basically. So um, <laughs> kind of in light of like the left is dead, and like um, the GNU project like created um, the basis for the modern internet, but nobody like even knows what that is. Um, so going forward, like what what can we do? I guess that's my question. Well, what what can we do to achieve which goal? Well, uh, I would prefer to leave that open. <laughs> <laughs> That's an important part of what can we do. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to. It's hard to identify co when something's co-opted or, or or not. Um, it's true that, Jesus. like, yeah, sorry, it, you know, like, the, all that software runs the internet, and most people don't realize that. Most people don't know what the internet is, you know, in in, in a lot of ways, beyond, like, how's, how's the thing run? Um, and, you know, when when certain, so, Richard Stallman and company do some great work with GNU, and then, you know, with, with what becomes Linux, and then it does a lot of service for the folks that they were, that they were opposing, and so maybe that's why it feels wrong, because uh, because it goes counter to their to their goals, and then those systems, you know, the, the capitalist systems, breed all kinds of other strange things, like um, the way that nobody knew what Git was until GitHub happened, and and certain like social media dynamics took over, and then that brings that same philosophy out to a broader sphere, and then and then can sort of pollinate those areas. Um, so the the sort of like the the path those ideas take and the way that they influence a whole suite of conversations is like um, I don't know it, it's nuanced and and from certain at certain points in time from certain perspectives seem like um, a disservice was done to a lot of those efforts and then you follow that narrative down a bit more and it seems like wow if it hadn't taken that turn maybe it would have never reached this broad of a community even if they don't know who Richard Stallman is um, I don't know if that's question. Um, so the the so basically you're calling me out on say on invoking the idea that class consciousness is only available to the proletariat uh, and then but art is, is somehow only available to the bourgeoisie well, and so therefore in a, in a Marxian sense that the proletariat is bourgeois. It's it's constituted through bourgeois society. It's yeah. it's, it's a, a class based on the disintegration of the third estate historically. So um, really, the Marxist project, right, is the reclaim of class. Um, to reclaim 
To, I'm sorry, to reclaim which class? Oh, to overcome itself as a class. To overcome itself as a class. Itself, right? so. Yeah, eventually, right? But I mean, you know, one of the big, I think, mistakes of lots of recent uh, Marxist scholarship is, is to kind of completely uh, sidestep the whole question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? And according to the traditional theory, right, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a very prolonged period, you know, and eventually it dissolves away, right? But it doesn't, like, will itself out of class, its class position, you know? It doesn't happen, you know, at the moment of revolution or something along those lines, right? That, that the um, <clears throat> class conditions persist for a long time. But uh, to answer your question more directly, and this, you know, may seem like and may indeed be, I don't, I don't think it is, but it may, may be cheating, um, um, but, um, you know, really the, you know, the typical position of the modernist artist <clears throat> is really a, um, a petty bourgeois position, and petty bourgeois means really um, it's not really a class position unto itself, it's a position between two classes, right, between the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, um, and it's a condition of, of, um, of um, being pulled by both those positions, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Uh, it's ever in danger of slipping down into the proletariat, um, you know, but it's also ever aspiring to, um, to reach up to, to become Bill Gates, right? Uh, to become bourgeois proper, which means the owner of the means of production, which means, you know, vast sums of wealth, right? It doesn't mean a doctor or a lawyer, right? It means, you know, somebody like Bill Gates. So um, the, um, um, the artist, uh, you know, another way to characterize the petty bourgeois is to say it's a small business person. And the artist is really a kind of small business person, right? They, you know, they've got their studio and they've got the sign and they've got their website and, and they're selling their wares, uh, you know, uh, and so on. Um, but the thing about that position, that limbo position of the petty bourgeois between the two class positions is that not only is it the ideological dream of becoming Bill Gates and the very real fear of precariatization of becoming proletarian, right, there's also um, the, the possibility of a kind of um, uh, class consciousness that's available to the petty bourgeoisie because they, um, because of their proximity to the proletariat, uh, and in that in that condition, it produces the condition of possibility of, of class traitorship. You know, so um, you know their petty bourgeoisie are really part of the bourgeoisie proper, um, but they have the they have a greater possibility for being a class traitor, uh, and that typically is the position of modernist artists, typically the position of academics, you know, and so on, um, who um, you know um, are. Uh, bourgeois by position, right, but are reaching down to an identification with the proletariat in order to, um, um, you know, make social change. Um, so, again, the, the categories themselves are not, you, you all know this, but the categories themselves are not uh, sociological categories, right, they're aspirational categories, they're not defined by your income, right, um, they're defined by a position, and that position, in, positionality is sort of in flux or in tension. So, that answer? Any uh, more questions or final questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, let's give our panelists a hand.